working drummer. Now kick it. This is the Working Drummer Podcast, serving up perspectives, experiences, and stories from ground-level working pros. Advice, tips, and secrets on how to build a career in the music business. What's up, everyone? This is Zach Albetta. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Working Drummer Podcast. Today, we're going to hear from Kent Auberly, who has been touring and recording with Christian Bush for the past couple years. He's been based in Atlanta since 2001 and has amassed a ton of experience here. In particular, we talked for a while about all the cover band gigs he's done over the years and the crucial role those kinds of gigs can play in your development as a player and as a pro. He is also the co-founder and former co-owner of the ATL Drum Collective, which is quickly becoming Atlanta's favorite drum shop, uh, and he has some good insights about that end of the business. As always, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, share your pics and videos using the hashtag Working Drummer. And if you have a second, leave us a rating and review on iTunes. All that is very much appreciated. We're happy to announce a new sponsor of Working Drummer Podcast. Let's hear from my partner, Matt Kraus, about that. So in Nashville, there are two great drum companies, Mapex and Sonar, distributed through a company called KHS America. And I recently approached them about the possibility of supporting our podcast, and they said, you know what, come to our office and check out and play this new entry-ish level Mapex kit that we are running a holiday promotion on. Uh, okay. So the idea uh, was more or less, if you dig the kit, talk about it. If not, we'll think of something else. They wanted me to have a real experience. And uh, so, yeah, I played it. It sounded great. Uh, now it's been a while since my first kit, but I have to say I lucked out and got a great kit for the money and it got me through college and into my professional playing years. I think those kinds of well-made entry and mid-level kits are hard to find these days, but this Mapex kit is a killer sounding and great looking kit. It's called the Mapex Storm and the kit I played was one up, two down, 12, 14, 16, 18 by 22 kick and a matching snare. Planet Z, Zildjian Cymbals, Crash, Ride Hi-Hat, and of course, all the hardware needed for that setup. I have to be honest, the kick pedal design was not my cup of tea, as it was a heelless plate. But it also tells me that Mapex is not afraid to think outside the box. The street price, as they call it, for all those drums, with hardware and cymbals, for this promotion, is $7.99. MapexDrums.com is where you can go check out the Storm series and find your nearest Mapex dealer. And I realize that there are those of you listening right now who have moved beyond this level, but if you know a student, a church, or anyone looking for a complete, great-sounding kit, uh, the Storm series by Mapex just might be the answer. We are thrilled and grateful to have KHS on board with the Mapex and Sonar brands and looking forward to telling you more about them in the coming weeks. But right now, Kent Auberly is going to tell you about some other stuff. Enjoy. I grew up in a small town called Fairbury, Illinois, mm -hmm. and uh, it's about 3,400 people um, just north of Champaign-Urbana. Um, I started taking piano lessons as soon as I could stand up and touch the keys. And, <laughs> um, I guess I was about somewhere between six and nine years old, I would say. One of those years, I my mom and dad took me to a high school uh, band booster concert to raise funds for the high school band mm -hmm. and uh this guy named john singer who uh still plays around nashville quite a bit but he was a freshman or sophomore at my high school at the time sorry no you're good and uh he uh came out and performed with uh the pops band on drum set mm -hmm. and like the whole evening i i just remember like it being kind of a just kind of boring because it was all like, you know, just pops concert type stuff. Right. But then when he got on the drum set and it was like this red sparkle Rogers kit. It's always a red sparkle, man. Yeah. Jeff, dude. Jeff Hamilton, his last record was called red sparkle because like yeah. his first, set. yeah. Anyway, go ahead. It was like a red sparkle Rogers kit. And he, when he started playing with the band, the whole room energy changed. It became like a party. And guys were yelling and getting hooped up and just, you know, it was it was really cool. And, and just everybody smiled. And I think it was just like at that moment, I don't know what it was. I, I guess like and rhythm just kind of like it just grabbed me. Yeah. And just since then, it was just I, 
it, that's what I had to do. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, so I guess it was about a year later, I must've been beating the crap out of everything in our house. But about a year later, my mom and dad, my mom, uh, found a drum set at a garage sale in Fairbury and I still have it. It's my Apollos. It's like a, it's like a black oyster or I forget what they call it. Um, but it's like a black oyster, 13, 16, 20 Apollo kit had a yeah. cymbal stand coming out of the bass drum. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Tom racked, she got it for $35 at a garage sale. That's beautiful. And that was it. And I, <laughs> and I literally, my cousin Tim, uh, came over and showed me how to sit mm-hmm. and, uh, Tim Rathman, he showed me how to sit and he showed me how to go boom, crack. And after that, it was just. <laughs> You're off to the races. I was done. Yeah. And I've watched him, you know, not long after that, MTV came out. And, you know, anytime there was a video, I would, re- if there was a band I like, I would video, like record their videos on VHS and I would watch them. And if there was something the drummer would do, I would slow it down in slow motion and stuff. I, I just became entranced into it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I did sports and stuff all the way up until college. Mm -hmm. So it was, there was a lot of elements of drumming that really inspired me to it. It was one, it was just this attachment to rhythm that I couldn't let go of. But then also there was this physical element that I really loved. And there was this raw energy that I really loved. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it literally just, you know, it just, I, I just absorbed everything I could. So, I mean, it sounds like you were just self-motivated from yeah. an early age. Did you, did you get put into lessons at any point? Or um, was it- I, I mean, I did, you know, I did school band starting like when I was in fifth grade right, with me too. Mr. Hammett and uh, Bruce Hammett was my band instructor. And then, uh, you know, I did that fifth grade through junior high and uh, I played my first concert on drum set when i was in sixth grade yeah. with our chorus our choir sixth grade choir and that was fun with mrs Bezgrove. yeah and uh so what was that experience like what was getting like the feedback from an audience it was for the first time the the thing i remember i'll be honest with you the thing i'll always remember is like i was i had my drum set set up and like this the, the sixth grade choir was on like risers right uh-huh. and my my drum set was set up to the left hand side this is at westview elementary and we're on the stage in the gym and my drum set set up on the left hand side and like um the risers on the right and this is Bez Bezgrove's on the piano up front and uh the the I just remember sitting down at the drum set and all the girls looking over at me going all right kid and I was just like <laughs> all right this this is kind of cool <laughs> you know I and, and it was awesome. And the same thing happened then that happened at the Pops concert. It's like after I got done playing, there was just a different energy in the room. And yeah. I think it was just, you know, I think that's when I started understanding what drummers are supposed to do. And our, we, you know, music, Seymour Bernstein uh, said music is a um, language of feeling. Mm-hmm. And we as drummers, add so much movement of air and pulse and sound Mm -hmm. that we can literally move rooms and not only move rooms, but move emotions. Yeah. And I just, you know, I still remember just the high I got when the crowd was just, you know, it went from the, the crowd just kind of sitting there, listening to everybody sing to all of a sudden like heads started bobbing. Right. People started moving. You yeah, know, few people were holding their ears because it was loud <laughs> as hell. But still, it was you know, uh, yeah, man, it, and it was awesome. Yeah. You know, it and I then it became then it became a different thing. Then it was just like, oh my god, I got to play in front of people as much as I can. Right, right. Because it was that it was it was what allowed me to connect with people on a different level than just hanging out and talking with people there's yeah. just something different about it man it's it's a different form of validation and i think you know different different people's um uh egos and insecurities need need different uh things to to be mm-hmm. okay and mm-hmm. and I, I like to tell people like my my machine runs on applause 
Yeah. You know, like that, that fills me up and getting the validation of a live audience, yeah. you know, for something that you are doing or that you just did. Yep. Um, and I, I had the same experience. I think like one of my first performances was at a talent show and I was probably fifth grade, like probably around the same age. Um, and I just, I played, I played along with a song and like getting that applause. Like I knew, I knew it would be, it, it was everything I knew it would be. You know, I saw performers get applause and I was like, I want that. Yeah. And then I got it and I was yeah. like, okay, this is it. <laughs> yep. yep. Absolutely. <laughs> so Absolutely. Uh, you went on to high school, marching band. Um, you know, I didn't do marching band. You didn't? I, no. My, my, I did eighth grade. I did uh, eighth grade um, band. And then I went to marching band camp and... It just, you know, they, they put me on snare. They put me on snare right away. And it just wasn't my thing. And I also was at in a small, really small school. I mean, mm. my school my school was 500 kids total in the whole high school. And that wow. was from every Cropsey, Four Strong, Wing, Chats, or six different towns. Wow. So you either played sports or you were in the band. Mm-hmm. And the thing was, is like I had my drum set at my house, right? So, and I I really enjoyed playing along with records more than I did being in the school band. Mm-hmm. So I just decided, you know what, I'm just going to do sports and then go home at night and on the weekends and play my drums. Yeah, yeah. And from that, I started like, you know, it was it was interesting because it was like it kind of moved me through different parts of my high school. It was like I was I would hang out with like the sports guys and the sports girls during the week. But then on the weekends, you know, I'd get together with the long haired dudes right, and right. play like rat records. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. it was like, it was, I kind of had buddies on both ends of the spectrum at the yeah. high school, which was cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I never did any marching band, but you know, I, I see that about you because like socially you seem, you seem very adept kind of in, in either vibe. Like I could see you hanging out at a Hawks game and being like the sports guy and like, and oh, yeah. but you know, I've also seen you at, hanging out with a band or hanging at gigs and yeah. like, you can really float between like those two kind of circles. <laughs> really? Like I see, I see both of those in you. Cool. When was the last time you played sports? I'm, uh, two weeks ago, Tuesday, I played uh, basketball. I played basketball at a, uh, um, there's a church in East Atlanta I go to every Tuesday night yeah. and, I, and I hoop there with some guys Man, every Tuesday night. I should, I should check that out. I, you should come, dude. I rolled my ankle like four months ago playing ball and it luckily the crap out it of did. I mean, it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't bad enough that I missed any yeah. gigs or anything like that. But I was talking with Mark in, in Delta Moon. I told him I rolled my ankle. He was like, dude, what are you doing playing basketball? Oh, of course. <laughs> of course. He said, that's a young man's game. Man. Yeah. <laughs> well, but, the, but the secret is, is playing with guys your age. Right. And not getting involved. Like the, I've, I used to go over there on like. Like they have the, they have games they run on Mondays and Thursdays, and man, it's just young dudes like in their twenties and. That's what I was doing. I was going to LA Fitness, and yeah. and I could hang with these guys. I could run with them, and it was just a freak, you know, ankle thing that happened. Yeah, but but, uh, but like two weeks ago, I got kneed right in the thigh, uh, and I finished. I played for about two or three more games. I ran for about two or three more games, and the t- thigh started tightening up. I'm like, oh, all right, time to go. Yeah, but you know, it's just for me. I d- I don't know, man. I. I, I kind of go back and forth with it, you know, because it's the same thing. It's like, I'll be on the road, you know, and like one day I, I still remember being on the tour bus and I had this scratch down the back of my neck. Oh man. And one of the guys, one of the guys in the band and everybody was in the room, you know, uh, my band leader was in the room and everybody, music director and everybody's in the, in the bus and man, what happened to your neck? I said, Oh, I got fouled. Fouled. I said, yeah, I was playing basketball. I got fouled. I was running some game, and they're like, "Man, you better be careful." Yeah. And I'm just like, "Well, but you know, you gotta live. You gotta live, yeah, man. Yeah. You know, it's like if 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 you know, you know, like if listen, if am I gonna go on a ski trip with a bunch of people right now? No. Right. Why? 
I don't ski. <laughs> I can't ski for crap. Right. So it's like if I get on some skis and I wreck, I'll probably really injure something. But basketball, I've played my whole life, so it's kind of like I know the flow of the game. Yeah. I know when to go inside, when to stay outside. You know, it's just yeah. You can just kind of when you feel the game, you don't have to worry about getting hurt. I, yeah, I got to come run with with you and that over thirty crowd, man. It's fun. <laughs> it's fun. Um, so we'll we'll go back to like kind of your your early story in a second, mm-hmm. but. This is a perfect opportunity to ask you about, um, before we started recording, we were talking about, you know, diet and exercise and all mm-hmm. that. And you mentioned that you used to be quite a bit heavier oh, yeah. than you are now, yeah. as did I. Um, so what's, what was your experience of, uh, playing and like the physicality of playing before you lost the weight and, and after? Um, well, you know, when I, when I did play, you know, I was this is when I was in central Illinois and I was, you know, just mainly playing cover gigs Mm -hmm. and I was eating a crap ton of bar food, you know, and you get home at, and in Illinois, I mean, every time you play a gig, you got a good hour drive to get back to your town, Mm -hmm. you know, because Illinois is like, unless you're in Chicago where you got bars everywhere, right. Central Illinois, like when I was living in Effingham, Illinois, we had to drive to Springfield, Illinois, which is like, it's a two hour drive. Yeah. So, the first thing you would do when you get done playing, you would go to like a Burger King, get you a super large Coke and some food just to get home. Oh, God. And it was just, you know, it just finally, yeah, and I got up to almost 300 pounds. Wow. You know, I like, I think I wear a 33 inch waist now, 33 or 34. And at uh-huh. the time I wore like a 46. Yeah. Triple XL shirt. Yeah. Um, and, but playing wise, you know, I, I was in that vibe and in that zone of playing the long cover gigs where it didn't really affect me as much Mm -hmm. but when it really when i started noticing it was affecting me was like and i was smoking Mm -hmm. you know i was it was you know i was i was i just wasn't a healthy person right but then what i started to notice was i wasn't progressing Hmm. um i would go into a studio session back then and i would struggle to connect to that creative element of music. Hmm. And a lot of it, I think, was just because I was playing the same cover songs every night. Mm-hmm. But I also think there was an element of it to where, you know, my I was so out of shape and I was so unhealthy that my mind wasn't really working in a creative space. It yeah. was working in a survival space. Yeah. And so when I... You know, my dad had a quadruple bypass and the doctor, you know, basically scared me straight. And, you know, when I turned, I got married, My, you know, I got married first time at like 25. And by the time I was 28, you know, I was, you know, weighing almost 300 pounds and the doctor scared me straight. And I was just like, you know, I, I got to do this if I'm going to change. And the other thing was, it was like, I went through this thing, like I was playing with this band called pop rocks and we had a singer who was a triathlete she was a triathlete and she had a great i mean she was ripped and she looked great on stage and because of her you know all the guys in the band started kind of getting more healthy you Mm -hmm. know myself the guitarist we both started losing weight and trying to get healthy we started noticing ourselves playing better but then you know the the economy in 2001 kind of crapped out in central Illinois Mm -hmm. and I go damn if I'm going to do this I gotta I'm gonna have to move to a city and I'm like nobody in the city is going to hire a 300 pound drummer Mm. you know and then it started getting to where it's like I had to like really start thinking about like my 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 first visual you know right right you know it's important to to look good yeah you know it's it's important to like if you're going to go out and play, you know, if you're going to show up and play a gig, you know, it's as easy as don't wear the shorts on stage. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's that easy. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's 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 little decisions that you make that, and your health is really important because, mm-hmm. you know, I knew then that, you know, if, if my, my future was going to um, include touring, and, and I did some touring in college, but it was, you know, it was like, van with a bunch of dudes right you know partying every night so it didn't really matter right but on a professional level it was like i had to get straight and had to get in shape um but yeah so i just you know switched out the soda to water and stopped smoking cigarettes yeah 
stop hitting the, the, you know, start packing myself some almonds or something to eat Mm -hmm. on the way home from gigs and, you know, surely, slowly, but surely, you know, I lost all the weight. Yeah. And did you feel your drumming change and open up? Absolutely. Absolutely. It was like it, it instantly, you know, once I started losing the weight, um, it was like there was no blockages anymore. It was mm-hmm. like I started, just, you know, I one of the things that helped me lose the weight was I started getting into yoga. Hmm. And I studied yoga, like did yoga almost every day for like four years, yeah. including meditation. And that aspect of it really allowed me to like open up channels to where like music is also like I could be jamming with somebody. And whereas before I'd start trying to figure out what to play. It was like it just would play me, hmm. and it it was really an interesting thing for me to open that up and feel that, you know. Yeah. And yeah, you know it, and I think because I was in good shape and my body was like instead of being in like survival mode, you know, um, it was more in productive mode. Yeah. And being creative, and. Just it just opened up a lot of doors for me in my drumming. You know, like I started playing double bass. I started, you know, bringing in more feeling. I started, I started to be able to swing more. I just, mm-hmm. it, just music just started changing. I started feeling things differently. You know. Let's fill in the gap from from because you mentioned you were like getting ready to move to a bigger city and yeah. and like really make a go at getting touring work and all that. Um, Back in high school, you're playing records and yep. and hanging out with the long hairs on the weekend. Yeah. So did did you did you go to college? Did you go on the road with some yeah. bands? Like I, what? I went to Eastern Illinois University. That's a pretty prestigious uh, music school. Yeah, we had Johnny Lane, yeah. Johnny e. Lane there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I went to school originally to be a special educator. Huh. Um, I never did take any like percussion classes or music classes, but I I befriended Johnny. Yeah. So. You know, and I played with a lot of, I basically just started, you know, I started going out to like, I I enjoyed going to see live music. So I started going out and seeing live music and I started meeting up with some different musicians and stuff. And then eventually somebody said, man, do you know any drummers in town? that We're we're opening up a jam night, man. We'd love to get some drummers. I I play drums. Yeah. And they're like, really? And I'm like, yeah. And I played baseball in college for like two years. So I, I was... Wasn't didn't really have time to play in bands and stuff till I, I was a junior. Mm-hmm. So when I went to eat, when I transferred to Eastern, um, you know, I really just I'd quit baseball and I just fell into the the music scene. And that was right when like alternative music was breaking, you know, and there was original bands popping up everywhere. You know, Eastern had a really cool college music music college atmosphere. You know, yeah. it was just like we had a great. FM radio station that played a lot of cool independent music. This is in Champaign Urbana, Charleston, Illinois, Charleston. South. But what was cool is we had Champaign just north of us. Uh-huh. So you know we also got to. I also got to experience at a young age that whole Champaign scene with like Hum, the Poster Children. Uh, you know, so many great bands coming out of Champaign uh-huh. um, and seeing them grow and l- watching how it's done. Right and. I, you know, I just got to where it was like, I, I didn't really have time to take any music courses because I was instantly playing because I found out people found out I could play drums. Right. Um, I started playing in like five or six bands, yeah. you know, yeah. and just hanging out at the clubs on the weekends and just meeting people and going to jam nights and, you know, just learning how to build relationships, mm-hmm. which to me was you know, and I know schooling and stuff like that is important. It's like if you want to learn like the theory and you want to learn all that, you know, going to a, a school is really important. But I think what a lot of schools miss out on, you know, is the relationship building aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Because unless you gain the trust, unless somebody has trust in you, mm-hmm. you're not going to get that call. Yeah. You yeah. can be you can you can have the greatest chops, you can have the greatest sight reading skills, you can have all that stuff, but if you're not a social person, yeah. It you're just not going to get that call. Yeah. You know, so I I really tried to focus on getting out and playing with as many bands as I could play with. Um even if it was just like somebody said, "Hey man, you want to sit in on a tune?" Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, I tried to say yes as much as possible and just focusing on being a accountable and you know 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I take, take every opportunity to show somebody that you can show up on time and not suck. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, it's interesting what you said about, about music school and, and college, because, you know, I, I went to college, I got a master's degree and, and it's, it's something that I wrestle with a lot and that we talk about a lot on, on this podcast, because, you know, you're, uh, Going, going to college and, and meeting people there can serve as your network. Like the, the people that you go through school with can serve as your network. And, and that's happened to me. And I've seen it happen to a lot of other um, musicians. They just, they find a tribe in school and then they get out of school and they're still in that tribe and they're right. all working and playing together and all that. Right. But th- the flip side of it is I've, I've seen it make so many musicians just go inward and they, I mean, they're diving into a thing. They're like, you know, they're they're studying an art form and they're exploring, you know, the history of it and their own creativity. But that's not a social activity, Mm-mm. you know. And it, it kind of just forces people to just be very introverted about it. And then when they try to get out into public, <laughs> right? You know, they're just very introverted and and not like you said, not very social. Yeah. Um, and it, every listen, there's validity to everything. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like if if would I like when I look back on, I'm like, God, I freaking had Johnny Lee, Johnny Elaine. <laughs> I mean, it's like, yeah, you know, he has Vic Firth marching sticks, right? You know, he was running the USA Percussion Camp. There was so much stuff there available to me, but I was kind of on a different path, right? But now that I look back on it, I sometimes go, Damn, I should have just taken one course. Mm. You know, I should have taken a sight reading course. I should have taken, you know, to keep my sight reading up. I should have taken a, you know, a, just a, some kind of a music course with him just to be in a room with him right. every day of the week. Um, but yeah, but, it, you know, everything is has its place and everything is valid. But I just, you know, it's, I, I agree with you, man. It's like sometimes when you go inward, it's just really hard, you know, to to explore after that Mm -hmm. because you're, you know, and, and a lot of it was, you know, I, 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 a lot of my roommates were music majors right? and, you know, they, everything they were playing, the majority of their stuff that when they got the opportunity to play, it was something that was extremely organized. Mm -hmm. And when they were practicing, they were always practicing by themselves. Right. You know, they were like, renting a closet right you know borrowing a closet it was their hour in the closet you know to practice their stuff Mm -hmm. and it's like whereas for me i found more i found more growth from going out and like living in the chaos (laughs) you know going to a jam night and sitting in with dudes you don't even know and like i don't know man you want to play something funky and e okay sounds good and you just you know you, you just completely went on this like trip with those guys Mm -hmm. and it was that that i enjoyed yeah you know yeah um so you're like a stone's throw away from chicago yeah i was about i grew up about two hours south did you did you venture into chicago professionally at all um a little bit you know i did some gigs in there i i to this day one of my favorite gigs i ever did in my life when i was about i guess i was about 24 23 my band Cherry Violence from Charleston, we got offered a gig to play two days after Christmas at the Metro in Chicago cool. for a college night. And it was just like, <laughs> we're playing the Metro. Yeah. But, you know, Chicago is a beast in itself, man. It's such a big city. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so, there's so many guys and girls up there just on a, it's just such a different hustle. Mm hmm. Yeah. You know, I just interviewed a, a drummer named Ed Breckenfeld, who was uh, born and bred Chicago and, you know, spent his whole career in Chicago. Uh, and it was it was really interesting to hear just like you said, what a big beast oh, of a man. city. The music scene is just is huge and self-contained, you know, doesn't doesn't seem to care too much about L.A. or New York or Nashville. Nope. It's like we're in Chicago and we got everything we yep. need right here. Yep. And I, and I, the thing that I, I can honestly say that I, you know, growing up literally in between Chicago and St. Louis, the thing that I think I, I learned from that was you better learn how to shuffle. 
<laughs> you better know how to swing. Yeah, man. You better know how to shuffle. Yeah. You know, you can you can play straight up rock and roll stuff to your ears bleed. Yep. But if you're going to like make any money whatsoever, you better learn how to play the shuffles, yep. man. You better know the difference between a Texas shuffle and a Nashville shuffle. Mm-hmm. You better know like the different feels, you know. You better know like how to play a, a nice light swing. You better be able to play with dynamics. Yeah. Ed you know. talked about that Chicago shuffle, like the both the both hands together. Yeah, 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 man. And it was the same in Kansas City. Like I, you know, I didn't really understand the difference between a swing beat and a shuffle beat before I got to Kansas City. Mm-hmm. Um, and after a, a few years of like my shuffle not quite feeling right, I, I finally sort of like I got it somehow. I, yeah. it wasn't anything I consciously did, but like when I left Kansas City, I got to L.A. and I would, you know, if I happened to play a shuffle on a gig. Somebody be like, man, yeah, that shuffle feels great, man. Where, like, where'd you learn that? I was like, Kansas City, man. Yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, it's like, it was the same for me. It was like, you know, when I first started practicing shuffles, you know, I, th- I think it just, you kind of give up trying to play it. Yeah. And you just start feeling it. Yes, absolutely. And it's, it's that thing where it's like, it's, it's you know, and I, I work on this with my students a lot. It's like, you know eventually you got to get away from learning it as a part yeah and learning the notes and getting to where it's the the notes don't even matter right it's the feel you get yeah. because man you can play a shuffle infinite different ways yeah the coordination is no big deal the coordination it's, is nothing it's, right. it's, it's it has no value yeah it's but if i mean you can play way less notes but if if the swing is right and the mm-hmm. feel is right and the weight moves right, that's what you know, it's, it's not a it's not about what we play. You know, it's it's one of the things that I tell all my students that you know, and I learned from a book um, called Effortless Mastery by Kenny Werner, yeah, which is a book. monster book. Yeah. It's unbelievable. You know, but it's the thing I tell a lot of my students. It's like, listen, you no one hears a note that you play. Mm-hmm. You know, unless you're maybe playing a jazz gig where you actually get a chance to blow for a little bit, you know, people might do it. But even those situations, a lot of times, no one hears a note that you play, but they feel everything that you do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, no one in the crowd is going to know you're playing a double paradiddle over a freaking pattern with your feet. Right. No one's going to know that. Yeah. You know, but if it doesn't make them feel it and doesn't make them dance, it doesn't have any value. Yeah. So I think like you it's like when we were when we were both learning our shuffles you know for me it was like there was a point where i just quit caring Mm -hmm. about what i was playing and i just wanted to make that person in front of me who was playing guitar and moving their hips i wanted to connect with them yeah 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 you know and make them move Mm -hmm. you know and yeah, it that it it speaks to two things that have been said on this podcast before but one one is uh uh, something my wife says all the time, which is whether whether you're playing in front of someone or speaking with someone, like no, nobody remembers the content. They don't remember what you played. They don't remember what you said. They only remember how you made them feel. Absolutely. Um, and the other thing is uh, that ultimately the drums are an accompaniment instrument. And, you know, certain drummers have taken it into the solo realm and made it a lead instrument, but its its primary role is one of accompaniment, and its primary purpose is to make shit feel good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know. When did you come to Atlanta? Uh, somewhere around 2001, 2002. So it was, it was I, I thought there was some something in between there, but you just yep. went from, co- what brought you to Atlanta? Why Atlanta? Um... I don't know, man. I just, uh, you know, I, I woke up one morning and just, I think what it was, I was playing in a cover band and it was my third, it was my second big cover band I'd play with in central Illinois. Kind of like where, you know, you're making good money on the gigs. Mm-hmm. You, you, you're in the rotation of the clubs. You got dates booked in advance. You got dates you booked in advance, yeah. all this stuff. And I think, you know, there was something going on within the band and I was like, I had this instant vision of the band splitting up <laughs> and I went, you okay, saw it. <laughs> okay. I'm well, and they did, they went on a long time after I left, but mm. I just, there was this weird moment where I was like, okay, 
I'm now 28, 29 years old. And if this band breaks up, the only option I have is to find players from the same town to start a cover band right. and then re reconvince the clubs that I've been playing for the last 10 years right. to give my band a chance yeah. to play that. And, and I just went, I just, I, I was like, I, it was this rut. Mm-hmm. And I went, I, I would rather starve than be in this rut. Mm-hmm. And I, and you know, I told the guys, my band, I said, listen, man, I'm, I, you know, I've made a decision, you know, in about four or five months, you know, I'm moving to Atlanta, mm-hmm. you know? And, uh, my wife at the time, um, she, uh, we had family here, mm-hmm. you know, so we, I was able to, you know, we moved down, we moved down here and we had a little bit of a backbone, you know, down here yeah. with some family in the area and stuff. But, you know, it was the thing I loved about Atlanta was I was able to connect with musicians online. This is when the internet was really starting to blossom. Mm-hmm. And I started connecting with people online and, uh, you know, like Sean O'Rourke was mm-hmm. one of the first guys I met online. Yeah, yeah. Marcus Petrusco was one of the first guys I met online. And, uh, you know, I, they were really open about the gig situation here. And they're like, oh, yeah, you know, it's like, man, you know, you'll make, you know, most gigs you play down here, you make at least a buck to a buck 50, you know. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, damn, <laughs> in Chicago, you make 50 bucks in tips. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, well, shoot. You know, I'm going to head down to Atlanta, mm-hmm. you know, and the weather was great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no more than Midwest winters. Yeah. So, you know, I just, we just kind of, I just kind of packed up in the middle of the night and took off Wow. and moved down here and just started hitting every jam night there was, mm-hmm. you know, I got a, I got a job for $9 an hour at a Tina's music, mm-hmm. which was in Forest Park. And my apartment I rented was in in Marietta. Oh my god! Because I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. You know. I didn't ask anybody. I was like, you know, I wasn't like one to ask for help. You know, I was like, oh, you know, it'll be fine. Right. They're like, dude, you took a job in Forest Park and you live in Marietta, and I'm like, yeah. And like, you know, I did that. I worked there and rebuilt their drum drum, uh, redid their whole drum department and everything. But then it just got to where I was like, you know, I, I got offered a job at Atlanta Pro Percussion. And that's mm-hmm. where I was like, okay, these guys are like five miles down the road. Right. So I ended up moving over there. But I, I, but it was just like, you know, I'd work at Atina's in Forest Park until about six o'clock. And then I would be like, okay, traffic is going to suck. So I would get in back in my car and I would drive back through the city. And on my way back, you know, I'd, I'd probably get... You know, I would hit the city around seven o'clock or so, seven thirty. Once I got everything closed up, mm-hmm. and then I'd just go grab a bite somewhere, and then I would hit Northside Tavern. Yep. But Johnny Knox was running the jam there. Johnny Knox or Lola, mm-hmm. and then I would walk go across town, and I would hit um, Darwin's, and then I would hit Nick's, <laughs> yeah. and then you know I would hit Darwin's, and then I would hit. Uh, well, actually, I would hit. It would go. Uh, it would go Northside Tavern, uh, Dixie Tavern. Uh, Darwin's Nick's and then I would eventually get back to my apartment wow. and I just did that like three or four times a night right just hitting all those open blues jams mm-hmm. on my way home yeah and I did that and then my phone rang right. for a gig and that was I started gigging yeah I mean it's it's the classic example of you you show up often enough mm-hmm. and consistently enough you know eventually your phone is going to ring and it, it may take longer in some cities than others. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I, I think when it, when it comes to moving to a new place like that, um, it's just, it's just being out mm-hmm. every night, as many nights as possible saying, like, like you said, saying yes to every opportunity. Everything. You want to sit in? Yes. You want to come hang? Yes. My birthday's Saturday. You want to come to the party? Yes. You know? Yep. Um, and I, I've talked about this before, but I, I think Atlanta, like the Atlanta music scene is especially welcoming in that regard. Like a new guy comes to town and everybody who meets you is, you know, all of a sudden just presenting you with all these opportunities. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, just just to be friendly. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like. Yeah. You know, nobody, nobody seems super territorial or super vibey or, you know, there's enough work to go around for everybody. And it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. So how, like how long did it take before you were gigging consistently and, and kind of where your career was moving at a, at a pace that you envisioned earlier in college? Um, wow. 
uh, I guess it was about a year into living here. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'd gotten some calls. I started doing like some, you know, just one off, like, hey, man, my drummer's out of town. You know, I jammed with you at this jam. Would right. you be interested in filling in one night? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, you know, one of the things I did before I moved here was I went on, at the time, I think it was a creative loafing site. Yeah. And I was just, I would just reach out to bands who are auditioning drummers, uh-huh. you know, and they would start sending me material. And I, you know, I joined this band named Big Jack Pneumatic, which was myself on drums. Uh, you know, I joined them and Kevin Williams, who was the bass player for The Swear, who's still one of my favorite bass players I ever played with. Mm-hmm. Uh, my buddy Robert Harrison was singing. And then Brandon Still was a keyboardist who's now in Blackberry Smoke. So I joined those guys and we just started hitting like, the original scene. Mm-hmm. Well then, but you know, there's no money in the original scene. Right. So I was like, well, damn, I got to figure out something to do through this. So we, um, were cutting an EP and Aaron Thompson was, uh, he was, uh, um, producing it. And so, you know, him and I were hanging out, uh, everybody had left and him and I were hanging out, you know, and having a beer. And he was like, Kent, so, uh, do you know, do you know a lot of songs? And I was just like, man, do I, I said, dude, I grew up in central Illinois. I said, I know all of the songs. <laughs> and he said, man, I've got a gig. I need a drummer for this weekend. It's Friday and Saturday night, the Buckhead saloon. You know, would you be interested? I'm like, hell yes. Yeah, you know? Yeah. So, and that was where I really cut my teeth. I feel like, cause mm-hmm. back then you had Buckhead saloon and you had park bench and it was such a cool vibe because you would play Friday night with it. Be Aaron was the main guy on guitar almost every night, but every night was a different bass player and then another guy singing. Yeah. And you know, it was just, it was like a house band gig, but there was this like circle of musicians who were always getting the calls. Right. It was a pool. It was a pool. Yeah. And it was awesome because man you started like it got to where it was like you would load in and you'd see like my buddy i'd see like my buddy hal mayhan the wolf loading in i'm like okay it's gonna be one of those nights man. right awesome yeah, you yeah. know and it's and you re, it, and then you would take a break and then while while you're on break you would walk around the corner to park bench where fran was playing and his band would like dude Fran's been playing for like five hours straight, man. No breaks. I need a break. And I'm like, okay, we'll sit in. So then you'd sit in with Fran and then you'd give those guys a break to grab a beer, have a smoke. And then you'd go back over to, you know, go back over to your gig. Yeah. And it was so great. And it was, you know, you're playing for like four or five hours. I think when we first started, it was 930 to 430 in the morning. Whoa. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Were bars open that late? Yeah. Yeah. When so, I first moved here, bars were you could stay open in Buckhead till four thirty. That's insane. That's that's one of the ways in which Georgia is kind of a bass awkward state. Because like until a couple years ago, you couldn't sell beer over five percent and none on Sundays. Yeah, but you could be open until four thirty in yeah. the morning if you were. And playing. what's amazing is that there's actually still people in the bar at four thirty. Oh in the man! And it was. You know, we joke, you know, I still see a lot of those guys, man. We run into each other quite a bit and we always joke about it, how it was like, you know, there's, you know, at the time, you know, you're like early thirties, late twenties, you know, and the bar, it's a party bar, you know, it's a college yeah, bar. Yeah. So, you know, they're bringing you shots and they're bringing you beers, you know, and literally like you would, you would play a set and then at some point in time in the night, you're like, man, we are all pretty hammered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we got a ways to go. And we got a ways to go. But then by the end of the night, it's like the gig was so long that you were literally went good to go, really hammered, sober again. Right. Oh man. So it, you know, it was it was just it was fun, man. Yeah. And it was so loose. Like it there was nobody there was absolute there was no char you know it was just like hey man do you know this song yeah okay well you know i kind of play it faster kind of with this it was so wide open right right and just all about fun this you know? this reminds me of like the um the the kind of wedding band and corporate band circuit and i mean it sounds like great training because like i know in it in atlanta and other cities around the southeast there's the emerald empire band and uh like in la there's west coast music but it's like all these agencies for corporate bands mm-hmm. that like you said have like a pool of musicians 
it's not it's not really a consistent group of people mm-hmm. um but they just they draw from the pool say you're on this gig and this other guy's on that gig and yep. just send everybody out and there's little if any rehearsal for these songs no you just rehearsal. get a set list <laughs> Yeah. Everybody does their homework. You show up to the gig, and like you said, there might be a little discussion about like, oh, I I do this thing at the, yeah. this point, or what key do you want to do it? But like, everybody knows the tune, yeah, you know. And and I mean, it sounds like a great skill, a great training ground for that yeah. kind of a just like show up, know these tunes, yeah, throw it down, yeah. And, and and like my first gig, and I, I never even got a set list. It was just showing up. And he goes, okay, we're gonna start off with some Tom Petty. Do you know uh, American Girl? I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> And and you just went for it, right? You know, and it was it was so great, man. Yeah. God, I miss those days. They were it was just I don't miss the late nights you right. know, that much, right? You know, but man, because there were nights at some point in time each night, it was like the band was so great. It was like Andy Birdsall was singing, or our buddy Ray would play guitar. Hal, the Wolf was on bass, or Sean McIntyre was on bass, and you know it'd be Andy Birdsall or or uh, um, Aaron Thompson singing or, you know, Hank Barbie's playing guitar. And it was just, these guys were just such great feel players. Mm-hmm. Everybody was a feel player. Right. You Nobody's know? trying to be a star there was no, on the Tom Petty song. No, there was no technical prowess <laughs> right. anywhere. And right. no one was about to show up with <laughs> technical prowess. It, it's like, I still remember like bringing a double pedal to the gig one time. And Aaron Thompson said, if you play that thing, you're not coming back tomorrow night. <laughs> Don't be bringing that. <laughs> Don't be playing the double pedal on this gig, dude. Oh, that's great. <laughs> you know, it was, great. it was so fun, man. Um, but it, I mean, it goes back to what we were talking talking about about you know feel being more important than coordination and and accompaniment being more important than soloing and uh you know i think i think especially in in college circles and and more artistic um you know with people with more artistic attitudes i think cover bands get a bad rap and and some sometimes they get a bad rap for good reason because some of those gigs suck and some of those bands suck but if you're if you're in a good cover band playing with good guys having fun playing for college kids yeah you know uh it, it just it it kind of uh it awoke in me um just the more more much more playing for the fun of it and yeah. and playing for entertainment and not uh not shouldering the burden of having to be creative having to be original doing the heavy lifting of getting an original band a gig right <laughs> you oh know, my god yeah um, and I, like, uh, I would encourage oh, any man. drummer anywhere to just take those cover band gigs, cover band yeah. gigs. I mean, it, it's, you know, they do get a lot, like a lot of people are like, Oh man, it's selling out. And I'm just like, you know, I still remember like I was in, I was playing with my buddy, Justin. I played at Fado for like four years with Justin and Jason and then that band was smoking. I mean, we, we got to where we were really tight and Brandon still from Blackberry Smoke played with us for a while. And I still remember us playing a gig up in, up in Minnesota. <laughs> and this young kid comes up to me and he goes, uh, he goes, so uh, all you guys play is covers, right? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's what the bar wants. So it's all we do is play covers. Don't you think that's kind of like selling out? And I was kind of like, well, man, I said, uh, you know, do you live at home with your parents? He goes, no. He goes, I got an apartment. I said, so where do you work during the day? Oh, you know, I, I, I work at a pizza place. You know, I deliver pizzas and all that stuff. I'm like, yeah, I play drums. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to talk about selling out, dude, it's like, you know, do you want to spend your time delivering those pizzas or do you want to spend your time playing drums? Yeah. And for me, the cover bands, what it did also was it's like there's a whole different aspect of rehearsing and practicing when you're practicing and you're rehearsing live in front of people mm-hmm. every night, you know, people, there's bands like you go to a city like LA, you got to spend hundreds of dollars just to get on a stage. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's when you're playing in a cover band, it doesn't matter. You know, the band might not be the tightest band in the world, mm-hmm. but you're in an atmosphere, you know, where you, you start to create your, your, your thing. Mm-hmm. And, you start to gain the trust right. because even in that cover band scene, you know, as, as easy as it can be, 
you know, I've replaced guys in gigs where like, dude, he was so drunk last night. He was oh, falling. He was falling off the drum throne and he couldn't even play. Man. And it's like, OK, so, you know, you learn how to hang. Right. You learn how to go. OK, I can't go that far. Right. Because the music, the gig is too important, mm-hmm. you know, and you start figure, you start seeing the guys who know how to do it. Right. And the guys who don't know how to do it. Yeah. And you start learning what to do and what not to do. And it's all happening on stage in front of an audience. Right, right. And you can practice in your bedroom to your till the cows come home. Mm-hmm. If you don't get out there in front of that, you're never going to find that comfort level mm-hmm. of being there. Right. You right. know? And you're never going to learn what not to do. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. not just about learning, like honing your craft and becoming a badass drummer. It's about yeah. learning, like you said, that shit not to do. Yeah. And a lot of it, like you said, is easy shit. Like, don't wear shorts to the gig. Don't wear shorts on the gig. Well, I mean, at Buckhead Saloon, man, I mean, yeah, kids yeah. would show up in flip, <laughs> shorts and flip flops. It didn't really matter. Right. It, it, but fun. there's other stuff like, yeah. don't get hammered on the gig. Yeah. You know, to the point where you can't play. Yeah. Um, but uh, it that reminded me of, of two other things, like just in terms of the virtues of playing in cover bands. One is like lately, I think over the last five years, I've seen more and more of these tribute bands uh-huh. that are, you know, at their core, they're cover bands. But right. it's a much bigger like oh, yeah. performance art with, you know, it's a it's a multimedia sort of presentation, whether they're doing a tribute to a specific band or a specific record. Um, but you know, playing in playing in cover bands can open up work like that. Yeah. And and those there are some bands making long bread doing that. Oh, yeah, thing. dude. Oh, um, yeah. So that's that's a great skill for it. But the other thing is, is, you know, if like you were talking about gaining the trust of some of your peers playing in the cover band, then when it comes time to do a cool original project or a cool tour or something like you're going to be on their mind because they've been gigging with you week in, week out. Yeah. Playing Tom Petty. And they have a good time with you. Right. And the other thing that I, I, I think is important that you learn from those cover gigs is you your song learning muscle mm. gets yeah. on a different level, man. Yep. Because like, um, you know, one of the gigs I did here in town, which was Metalsome, which was a live band karaoke gig, mm-hmm. we had to know like 230 songs. Yeah. And you were playing them to a cl- click track, and you were playing along with keyboard tracks, and it was karaoke, so there was a different singer. Right. And some of the singers, you know, at 2 o'clock in the morning, Steve, who's wearing the Georgia polo and the pleated khakis, <laughs> is singing Journey. Oh, God. You know, it's... it's <laughs> but when you were learning those songs, I, like, I've had to learn so many songs yeah. that... I started to understand, you know, then I started getting calls by guys who were in original bands saying, hey, man, I've got a 30-minute set. Right. I need, you know, I'll pay you this. I need you, you know, it's two nights from now. My drummer's having a baby. Can you do this weekend run of shows with us? Mm-hmm. And because I've, because I had exercised that muscle of learning music so much from the cover bands mm-hmm. that that became, yeah, because it's like, okay, well, you know, it's rock and roll primarily, or mm-hmm. you know, it's a blues gig, whatever. But you just learn how they think, and you 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 learn how to write yourself little cheat sheets. Yeah, you know, you, you it's just you learn how to be a pro right. and how to show up and crush with at minutes notice. Yep, yep. You know, and the other thing about about learning songs quickly is when you're when you're translating those skills to an original project. Yeah. Uh, you know, the sooner the sooner you can learn the form of a song, you yep. know, your verse, chorus, bridge, whatever. Yep. The 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 sooner you can just get a handle on that shit, the more you can focus on what you're actually playing. Yeah. And coming up with a cool drum part. Yeah. And listening to the rest of the band and figuring out how to react to them. And you're yeah. not you're not worried about like what the hell is coming up next. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Because that's the worst thing, man. Yeah. When you're thinking ahead. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I still struggle with that sometimes, man. I call it uh setlessitis. <laughs> to where it's like, you know, and I've really, you know, ever since I started touring with Christian, I really started trying to really you know, focus on that mm-hmm. and not allowing that to happen, which is set this itis is like when you're playing a song and you're in the middle of a song yeah. and something in your brain makes you look at the set list to see what the next song is, right. which it doesn't matter. Right. It right. doesn't matter. You're, 
you're playing the song yeah, now. Finish this song. Finish this damn song. <laughs> then look at the set list, yeah, you know. Yeah. But but yeah, so you, like the cover band thing. Not only did it, which this is good, man, because I don't think people talk enough about the value of cover bands. Yeah, yeah, you know. But the cover band thing. Not only does it make you one, you get the you get the value, you get the um, you get to practice on stage in front of people, you get to learn how to play music. But man, I mean, I wouldn't. I can honestly tell you, I would have never had, I would have never learned the Rosanna Shuffle <laughs> if I hadn't, if a dude hadn't gone, hey man, we play Rosanna yeah. for a gig. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, I got to learn how to play Rosanna. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, and so what it does is it's like when you're playing four hours of music, you're hitting so many different feels mm-hmm. that if you're playing Rush in your basement and you nail every Rush tune, it's amazing and yeah. it's awesome, but unless you allow yourself to venture out into all those different fields, mm-hmm. you know, if, if you're studying by yourself, you have to like make yourself find those things. Yeah. But when you're in a cover band, it's thrown on top of you. Right. Right. You know, and you will learn how to play those different fields. And nobody wants to hear YYZ at their wedding. <laughs> Shit, no, dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about it. Maybe somebody. Maybe knows. you and me. You and me might, but that <laughs> that probably wouldn't go over well. My, when I got married, my my best man was like my best friend from college, and uh, he he gave the best opening to a best man speech ever. He said, "When when Zach and I first met our freshman year in college, I didn't think we were going to be friends because he wasn't into video games and I wasn't into Rush." <laughs> <laughs> touched on it a minute ago but but your main gig for a few years now has been christian bush Mm -hmm. how how long you been doing that um it's oh man it's i think it's over two years i think it's been a little over two years yeah yeah so tell for people who don't know tell people who christian bush is where he comes from uh what his deal is yeah christian is a um uh man he's He's an Atlanta legend, as far as I'm concerned. Um, he was in a, he had a band called Billy Pilgrim, mm-hmm. which uh, did really well for itself. You know, he's a singer songwriter. He's multi platinum, you know, multi Grammy award winning. Um, he was the founder of the band Sugarland. Mm-hmm. Um, he wrote all the songs for Sugarland, uh, and uh, you know, it's it's a pleasure to play with him. Mm-hmm. And he, you know. And, you know, above all that stuff, he's just a, he's just a super cool dude. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's yeah. just a he's just a cool dude. So how did how did you get on his radar when it came time for him to to have a touring drummer? Like, did you know him already, or was it an open audition? You know, or? um, I I honestly, man, I I was never really I never really listened to country. Mm-hmm. You know, um. Because I was playing a lot of the rock gigs, right. you know, I was really kind of I was playing with James Hall at the time. I was doing cover gig. I was just playing a lot of rock stuff. I never really did a lot of country, so I never really listened to it too much. Um, and uh, you know, I was teaching some lessons at, at um, ATL Drum Collective, and you know, Kenny Creswell came in. Kenny, <laughs> Joe Kenny, man, <laughs> who Kenny's played with everybody. Yeah, you know, and Kenny was like, "Hey, man." Um, would you be interested in a gig? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and I said, who's it with? And he goes, it's a, it's a country gig, man. I'm like, hell yeah, dude. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm down for whatever. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know? Um, and uh, so he says, well, I'll be giving you a call. You know, you'll have, there's an audition and all that stuff. So I got a call from uh, Brandon Bush, the music director and Christian's brother, you know, and they gave me an audition they sent me four songs to learn, mm-hmm. you know, in about four days. Yeah. And I would shed in the crap out of them and uh, went in, did the audition. And it was amazing. Like when we did, when I walked into the audition, you know, and it, it, again, it's, it's about relationships. Mm-hmm. You know, I walk into the audition and it's like I walk in and I, I walk into the room and the first person I see is Benji Shanks, the guitar player. Yeah. And I looked at him, I'm like, Benji Shanks? Yeah. I, had, I had no idea who was in the band. Mm-hmm. So I walk in, I saw Benji Shanks and he was like, hey, man. And then I saw Michelle Malone, who I was really good friends with. I was like, Michelle, man, awesome. Mm-hmm. So there was this instant kind of vibe and trust. Right. 
you know, and then I, I played the best I could on the audition and, you know, and I got the call a couple of days later. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, my first show with, I, they sent me a 90 minute set to learn. Um, and my first show was in a week and a half to learn. So did Man. a lot of shedding. Yeah. That's um, what? 30 songs. Yep. No rehearsal. Wow. My first show. And, and what's crazy. And I kind of lucked out on this. My first gig was actually supposed to be the grand old Opry. Oof. And I was like, um, um, yeah. um, yeah. <laughs> um no rehearsal. Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, but they ended up using the house band for that gig, uh-huh. which ended up working great because that gave me a day off in Nashville with the band. And, you know, I went to this radio thing um, with the band, you know, and I met Christian for the first time. So you hadn't even you didn't meet him in the audition? There were, nope. Wow. So it was just the music director, his brother. Brian, that, like, Brandon was the person I met. Yep. Man. And so when I met Christian, he, you know, we were out in the parking garage. He goes, I don't know you yet. And Brandon goes, this is Kent. He's going to be playing drums with us now. And he goes, oh, man, great to meet you. And so we go inside, and they're setting up the radio thing, you know, a little acoustic radio show. And Christian goes, hey, man, come over here for a minute. And he pulls up a little table, two chairs, and he sits down. And he just, you know, he just basically said, man, we want to welcome you to the family. You know, I, I know you play with James Hall. I'm a huge fan of James. Um you know, I, and he explained to me the difference between the rock world and the country world. And it, man, I instantly was just like, oh, this is, this is great. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and it took my, all my nerves away. Right. And then. And what did, what did he say about the rock world versus the country world? Well, you know, it's, it, the main thing is it's like, you know, when you're, when you're touring in a rock band, you're in a van mm-hmm. and you're on the road for months at a time, you're crashing on, you're, you're doing, you're, you are starving artists. Right. But at his level of country, the country scene, which is really cool about it, it's kind of a weekend warrior thing, but on a different level. Yeah. So, like, we would get on a bus Wednesday night. We would play a gig Thursday, Friday, Saturday, be mm-hmm. home on Sunday. Yeah. You know, it was livable. Yeah. You I know? think a lot of bands are doing that these days. It's not. It might have, like, started with the country scene. I don't mm-hmm. know. But I think bands... Uh, across genres, uh, especially at the higher level, like mm-hmm. they're not going out for months at a time. No. It's it's just you know not sustainable. And, no, it's um, you know, and he's a big family guy. You know, he's got two beautiful kids, and mm-hmm. um, and he was just like, you know, it's it's a great place to perform. It's a great place to perform in because one, there's a lot of good work. Um, radio is still extremely important. In country, mm. which rock radio is dead. <laughs> yeah. I mean, unless, you know, the only thing you hear on radio now in rock and roll is classic rock. Right. You know, but country radio is still pushing new music. So, it man, it's it's just a different level of professional, mm-hmm. you know. And then when you get on the road and you meet all these other drummers and you meet all these other musicians from other bands and it's just like, dude, these guys are slaying. Yeah. These guys are just not only great musicians, but just the coolest, coolest dudes, you mm-hmm. know, and just real pros. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we we got done with the Nashville thing, and we went to Cincinnati, and I had my first show in front of a festival crowd yeah. with no rehearsal, yeah. and I, I brought a little notepad with me, and I set it down by my click track that I created for all the tunes, mm-hmm. and I was the only person heard to click. Nobody else heard to click except me. Right. So... I had a little notepad and and I set a camera up by my drum set for every show. And it wasn't to like shoot video to be released. It was just for game film. Right. Because I was learning Christian on stage. Yeah. So if he turns around and said something to me, you know, if I have time between songs, I might jot it down a note. Right. But it, worst case scenario, I've got it on tape. Right. So after we would play the show, I would get back on the bus and just get in my bunk, get the laptop out and just put my headphones on and listen to the show and just watch the show intensely. Mm-hmm. You know, and it was everything from, you know, he was constantly like turning around and go like, I, I still have the video somewhere. We were playing in Portland and I was playing uh, um, our song uh, "Southern Gravity," and I, you know, I'm playing it. Ta, 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 ka, jing, jing, ka. And he turns around. And he goes, "Play it so I can hear it." <laughs> <laughs> and you know, so the next night I'm like, "Ka, ka, yep. right, you know right, what I mean?" Right. So, That's yeah, great. man. And it, it, he's 
and him and Brandon worked because they're brothers and they've been playing music together since they were kids. They work so great together and it's such a great, great place, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I've grown as a human and I've, you know, I mean, I went through a divorce yeah. on that bus, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, when I was going through a major life change like that, you know, Christian was just like, man, this is, I've created this place for people to feel safe. You yeah. know, this is your home. You're safe here. Right. And man, it was just like, it, it was such a nice place to be in, in my life. And yeah, I, I owe them dearly. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And that's another thing about like having, having a tribe musically, you know, whether, whether you're on the road with them constantly or, or whether it's just more of a community in a city, mm-hmm. I think for musicians, especially it's, it's, it's such a chosen family, Yeah, you know, uh, and, and a community that can, uh, you know, rally around a person yeah. who's having a hard time, whether it's physically or financially or emotionally or, yeah. or whatever. Like I've, I've found that in every city I've lived in, um, like musicians catch each other. Yeah. You know? It's the arts, man. Yeah. The yeah. art, you know, it's like the, 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 the regular world could end today. <laughs> and as long as the art world is still around, yeah. the artist will survive. <laughs> you know, you think the artists are going to survive the zombie apocalypse? I think the artists are going to survive the zombie apocalypse. Okay. I really do. We're in the home of walking dead. Here, we'll so. be okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, but you touched on something really interesting. It's like, you know, cause it is a community and the thing you got to understand also, and this is important for, you know, all musicians to understand it. And this goes even back to the cover gigs. The community is not just the musicians. Mm-hmm. The community is the tour manager. Yep. The community is the dude working the door at the bar that you're playing at every yep. night. The community is the bartender at the bar every night. Yep. Because the the best thing that you can have somebody say to you, my favorite compliment I've ever gotten is when I would go after playing at a place a lot and then being gone for a couple of shows, you know, whether family thing or whatever, I'd be gone, have a sub come back and say man we missed you <laughs> it's like yeah, dude yeah, you're our favorite man, we love having you play here you yeah. know we love it when you're playing here and man when you when you get that type of feel vibe you know it's like okay so yeah man so like if you're playing in a bar man go up and talk to the door guy yeah go i think I've, I've said this on the podcast before but like if you if you want your band to get in good with a venue get in good with the bartender, the bussers, the doorman. Absolutely. Those people are the ones with their finger on the pulse of the room. Mm-hmm. And they're going to tell the manager and the owner, here's here's what it was like that night. Yep. You know? Yep. Um, and yeah, like you said, when you show up next week, they're going to be like, I'm so glad it's you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's going to be a great night. Yeah, you know? exactly. For the first few years of its existence, you were part owner of the ATL Drum Collective. Yeah. Um, which is a great drum shop in, in Atlanta. Um, and, uh, I just wanted to get your perspective as, you know, someone who spent so much of your life as a consumer (laughs) of drum products. What did, what did you learn on the other side of the desk dealing, dealing with manufacturers Hmm. and distributors? And, um, what, what do you think that most, what do you think the average drum shop customer doesn't understand about running a drum shop? In the time that I was, you know, um, in the drum shop, you know, and in the time that I spent there, you know, and, and, and I do, there's, a, there's a lot of me that misses it, you know, mm-hmm. um, but I just, there's, it's just time, you know, I just, it, it gets to where my touring and stuff works and it's just, you know, if you just don't have time to put, if, if you're going to do that, you got to be all in. Yeah. yeah. And I just can't. Right. You know? So, but I don't know if I ever really, I, whenever I was like working in retail, you know, I started working in retail for the main fact it was like, you know, I wanted to be in a position. I wanted to be somewhere during the day where musicians were hanging out mm-hmm. because it gave me another network opportunity. Right. Um, so I think when I so there's my Midwest coming out. So yeah, so, <laughs> so yeah, you know, super. It sneaks in. There. So yeah, it does. <laughs> um, you know, I think the the thing that. I would tell guys as far as like, you know, I actually wrote an article about this, but don't be the guy that shows up at a music store and plays on the drum set for 20 minutes. (laughs) Don't be that guy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, don't walk into the guitar center and ask for the demo sticks 
and go play on a drum set for 30 minutes. You're not impressing anybody. Right. All you're doing is ticking off the dude who's trying to make a living by making the sale of the snare drum to the parent. Right. Right. That's all you're doing. And you're ticking off the other customers. And you're ticking off the other customers. (laughs) Like, I still remember, man, going to a GC one time. And there's this dude just blowing on this drum set. Mm -hmm. And it's just loud as all get out. And I look over at the dude behind the counter and because he can't, their policy at the time was, you know, not, don't let anybody, people can play. Right. And he's just sitting there just looking like he's being destroyed, <laughs> like beat up by a boxer. Yeah. Yeah. And I go walking in the symbol room just to take a break. And right. I said, okay, I'm going to walk out here and I'm going to, I'm just going to nudge this guy and be like, Hey dude, you know, don't, don't yeah. just stop. Yeah. It, it, not that you're not playing good. It's just, this is it's not, this not, not this, the time don't do this. Place. Don't yeah, do yeah. this. And I couldn't uh, because I walked out and he had earbuds in. Oh my God. And an MP3 player. Come on. He was literally like practice. Like, Oh, he, he was putting, using guitar center as a practice. It was his bedroom. Wow. And I was just like, okay, man, you know, the pro walks up to the, four thousand dollar gretsch kit and goes that sounds good i don't have to play that to know it sounds good right the heads that you put on it are going to make it sound different Mm -hmm. the room that you're going to be in is going to make it sound different you know if you're looking at the six hundred dollar or seven hundred dollar drum set it doesn't matter if it's birch maple it doesn't matter yeah if it looks good you're going to make it sound good right you know and you know if it's it's from working in shops and, and and believe me, I love my kit. I love my gear. Mm-hmm. There is no better place where I'm at than when I'm sitting on my gear. Right. But if you're going to be a pro, you better learn to be comfortable on other gear. Yeah. Because when you fly to California and you play a gig, you're not bringing your seven piece kit. Right. You're showing up to whatever is there. Right. And sometimes it's everything, cymbals, pedals, thrown. You're walking, like when I played, I, I toured China for a month, mm-hmm. two years in a row. Wow. And I can't even describe some of the kits I showed up to, dude. I was just like, okay, I need to make this work. And it's what I just, what I tell guys all the time, you know, what's the best, they'll say, man, what's, what's the best kit in the store? You know, and I'll be like, well, you know, here's the question you got to ask yourself. If you play all these drum sets, well, are you going to be able to tell the difference between one drum set to the other? Mm-hmm. One, but two, I guarantee you, Sonny Emery walks into this store, every one of these drum sets are going to sound freaking amazing. Yeah. So, what I would tell guys is that, you know, find your sound, mm-hmm. you know, and try out everything as you can, mm-hmm. you know, try out symbols, symbols, especially man. Yeah. Symbols are a huge part of your, your feel and your sound and you can travel with symbols. Right. So fo- if you're going to focus on stuff, focus on stuff that you're going to travel with, focus on a pedal, focus mm-hmm. on sticks, focus on symbols, you know, you know, probably not even a snare drum, right? you know, right. but just, Understand that, you know, the guy behind the counter is trying to pay his rent Mm -hmm. with the person on the phone. Right. So if you're playing, if you're practicing, you know, a tune and playing double bass and blowing chops on a freaking drum set that you don't own. Right. That you're not going to buy. That you're not going to (laughs) buy. It's, you're not helping anybody. Yeah. So during the time you spent there, um, what did you learn? What did you learn about the Atlanta drumming community and the Atlanta music scene that you didn't know before? Because you know you got all drummers from all walks of life and yeah. all backgrounds and yeah. all ages and you know levels of seriousness, pros, weekend warriors, kids. Yep. Um, what I mean, you you had an interesting window into uh, like the cross section of, of yeah. Atlanta drumming. Yeah. So what what did that what did what did you see? What did you learn? It's it's just cool. <laughs> You know, drummers of all styles of music, all walks of life, you know, all d- different races of people, different, yeah. you know, from different parts of, te- parts of town, you know, guys coming, guys who are on the road and they would come in and it was just like so welcoming. 
Yeah. You know, the, the, the drumming community in Atlanta is so welcoming. And that's the one thing I'm proud about that shop. I am very appreciative of the time that I did spend there. And, you know, I've met, I've made so many great friends yeah. being there. You and, started a good thing. Well, thanks, and man. And it continues. Thanks, man. Yeah. 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 So what's coming up with Christian Bush? You leaving town again? Um, you know, we've been, we've been off for a little bit. I mean, we've been doing a lot of weekend stuff here and there, but, um, we're in the process of Christians in the process of putting out a new record. Mm -hmm. So, um, the thing that I've been doing mostly lately, which is really exciting, man, is I've been doing a lot of session work, Mm -hmm. um, at his studio, um, called, uh, the projector room in Decatur. That's Christian studio. That's Christian studio. Yeah. And Tom Tapley is the producer and engineer there. And, you know, it's, it's, Again, it's a it's a cool little community, mm-hmm. and uh, you know. So the session I've been doing a lot of uh, demo sessions and stuff like that, and you know, it's that's showing me a whole another side, you know, of something that is is another thing that's really hard to get into, man. Mm-hmm. You know, I get I, that's one thing people ask me all the time is like, how do I get session work? I'm like, get lucky. You get, you, <laughs> well, there's really two ways to do it. You can one. Go out and buy you a smoking Pro Tools rig, start your own studio, right. and be the studio owner, producer, engineer, and drummer. Right. You right. know? Or you just play, 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 and you you create the relationships where, you know, they invite you in. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same as, like, you're, you're playing in the cover band, and then you get invited yeah. to go on the road or be part yeah. of the original project. Like, yeah. if you put in time with, with people and and develop trust with them, then, yep. you know, eventually you're going to end up in the studio with somebody who knows you and likes you. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's, it's been a real blessing, man. We've been making some great, really cool music and been doing some songs for a lot of really cool artists. And, you know, it's, it's, I'm excited, man. And so I, I, you know, the, I'm not sure, I don't know all the details on the record and when it comes out and stuff, but I know we got, you know, we're going to be busy here soon and, yeah. and uh, I'm looking forward to get back on the road and, Hitting every night hard and making people dance and smile. <laughs> Love it. That's living the dream, man. Yeah, man. Great talking to you. You too, man. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Great talk with Kent Auberly. He is one of those down-to-earth, verse-chorus, bridge kind of drummers. I love it. Uh, I got to go play some basketball with him, too. I'll let you know how that goes. Maybe we'll post some video. Maybe not. Uh, anyway, thanks to my podcast brethren, Matt Kraus and Mike Jackson, for making this happen every week and including me in the sandbox. And thanks to you all for listening. Have a good one. Bye.